Before we understand the pathophysiology of acne, we have to be familiar with the pilosebaceous unit. The name is derived from pilo, meaning hair, and sebaceous, meaning the sebaceous gland, which is the oily gland. Of course, we have much more oily glands in the face. The pilosebaceous unit is formed by 1. the hair, 2. the erectus pili muscle, and 3. the sebaceous gland. The muscle is involved in erecting the hair, and this happens when we feel goosebumps. And the sebaceous gland works by maintaining an oily and moisturized hair. So that's the pilosebaceous unit. The first step in the pathophysiology of developing acne is plugging the hair. And this can be anything from discomatized cells or dead skin cells to stuff that we put in our face like makeup for example, or sometimes simply dead bacteria and other derivatives. Once the pilosebaceous unit is plugged in, the sebum that is secreted from the sebaceous gland will continue accumulating. And this sebum is a very good nutritional material, so it will provide a good medium for the bacteria to grow, especially the propionobacterium acnes. Keep in mind, androgens like testosterone promote the activity of the sebaceous glands to secrete more sebum. So indirectly, androgens increase the chance of having acne. The sebum will provide nutrition not only for propionobacterium acnes, but also for many other organisms. So most of the acnes are polymicrobial. These accumulated bacteria have lipase, and they can convert the sebum into free fatty acids. This free fatty acid can irritate the skin and cause inflammation. They also release pro-inflammatory mediators, which also increases inflammation. So the stages are as follows. First, we have the plug, and then we have a white head, which we call a closed comedon. The closed comedon will be oxidized by air, and that will form an open comedon, also known as black head. And then the inflammation will start by the bacteria and the pro-inflammatory mediators, and we will have a pimple, and finally a pustule or an acne. The severity of acne is divided into mild acne, which is mostly comedones that are prominent, moderate acne, which is mostly pustules and papules, and these heal without causing any scars, and severe acne, which we call conglobata, and this is mostly cysts, and they cause severe scarring. The medications that most commonly cause acne include steroids and lithium. The acne will develop after starting the medication, and they will disappear if you stop these medications. The most commonly used and effective treatment of acne is isoretinoin. It's a derivative of vitamin A, and it is very effective, although it is very highly teratogenic. So even a small amount or a small dose can cause severe teratogenicity and defects in the newborn. So before starting this medication, you have to make sure that the patient is not pregnant. And actually, in clinical practice, we take not one, but two pregnancy tests before starting isoretinoin. And if the patient is already pregnant, we can use either erythromycin or minocycline. Both of these have topical and oral forms. Other less common and less known medications include peroxide, sulfur, salicylic acid, which is aspirin basically, azelaic acid, glycolic acid, and other antibiotics. Use the link below to get access to the full dermatology course. This includes more than 60 lectures with study notes and revision cards. You will also get access to the flashcards and MCQs. Thank you for watching.